a children's librarian, and I am the creator of this program called Mother Goose on the Loose. And I'd like to start out by telling you a little bit about the history of Mother Goose on the Loose. So I started out as a children's librarian in New Jersey way back in the early 1980s when libraries were not doing programs for kids under the age of three. And um, in my library, it was a time when budgets were full of money. And so the children's department had four full-time librarians, three part-time librarians, a secretary, and a graphic artist. The head, I'm sure it's not like that anymore. The head of the children's department had a baby at home. And one day we got this shipment of felt with different colors and a lot of different shades of green. So our graphic artist made a felt pop and then she made a whole bunch of circles of green in different shades and she put it together. She went to the head of the children's department. She said, look, peas, porridge, hop. So the head of the children's department said, hey, that's really cool. Why don't you make more felt pieces? Make a piece for each nursery rhyme. And she gave her a list of nursery rhymes. So the graphic artist made all these pieces. And then we advertised that we were doing a Mother Goose program. And people came out of the woodwork. Because back then, we didn't have Google. And you know, you, there wasn't stuff. There weren't mommy and me classes. There wasn't kinder music or kinder gym. So basically, what happened was if you had a baby, you suddenly became isolated, and you were home with your baby. And then once the baby started to be able to walk, then you could go to the playground and meet other parents with kids that age. But really, in the first few years of your child's life, there was nothing to do. And suddenly, the library says they're doing this nursery rhyme program. So people flock to the library. What was the program? We had a flannel board. We put a piece on the flannel board, and, we, and we'd recite the rhyme. Either the baby was crawling around on the floor, or maybe nursing or something. But we'd take the piece down, and then we'd put another piece up, and we'd recite the rhyme again. That was the entire program. And looking back on it, it sounds pretty boring. But back then, when there wasn't anything else, it was like wonderful, and people came, and then they stayed afterwards, and they taught, and so it was a big success. After a while, I left that library, and I went to a very small library in New Jersey, where I was the entire children's department. And for those of you who work in small libraries, you know that <clears throat> there's stuff that you have to do, but then there's also a lot of flexibility as to what you want to do. And I thought that was a pretty cool age to work with, but there had to be more to it. So I started studying a bit about nursery rhymes, and I found out that for just about every rhyme, there's something you can do with it. There's knee bounces, there's foot tapping, there's hand clapping, and I decided to recreate that program. So my version of it had chairs in a circle with a rug on the floor, and people would come and bring their babies, they'd sit in the chairs, and the babies would either be crawling on the rug or in the parents' laps, and I invited someone from the community to come in and talk to the parents. It might be a social worker talking about what happens when you have two people who used to be alone together and suddenly this third being interrupts your life, or a dentist who talks about teething. But they talk very informally for five or ten minutes, then maybe another five minutes for questions, and then we'd start doing the nursery rhymes. But instead of just reciting a rhyme, I'd have the parent put the child on their lap and we'd do all the motions with the rhymes and we'd recite them twice. I did have flannel board pieces, because I found rather than having a written list, it was really great because if I put a piece up there, that would tell me what rhyme I was going to do. But I didn't have lots of different pieces to fiddle with. It was one final word representation for each rhyme. And then in 1986, I moved to Israel, and I got a job at the Israel Museum in their youth wing. The Israel Museum is the National Museum of Israel. It's in Jerusalem, and they have a youth wing just for kids. It has two floors. Um, they have two exhibits one on each floor, and then they have classrooms where they teach art, and they have a recycling room where you make things out of recycled materials. And they have a library. So as an English language librarian, my job was to highlight the books according to the illustration. So they're all on the shelf and not the door according to the illustrator, not the author. And when I cataloged them, if there was a book that had absolutely nothing to do with cows, but it had a great watercolor with a cow, I would add as one of the subjects, cow-watercolor. And then if one of the art teachers came in and said, today we're going to be learning to draw cows. Can you get me a book with cow and watercolor, with pen and ink, a cow with oil pastel? I could get her copies of all those books. And she put it out on a table, covered it all with a clear piece of plastic, and the kids could look at the illustrations as they were working. And I also got to do story time in English. And I got to do fun things, like I would read the book Marette on the High Wire, and um, then take the kids to the Impressionist Gallery and ask if they could find the picture with someone walking on a tightrope. Or um, one time we had an exhibit on houses, and we had an adobe hut. So I took the kids into the adobe hut, and I read Tommy Day Paul's Alice Nizzy Nazzy, which is the story about a witch who lives in an adobe hut. And I was having a great time. I was in Israel for just three months. 
when um, I met a wonderful man, got married, and I had a son. My son's name is Alon. It's a Hebrew word that was very popular at the time that means oak tree. So here I am doing programs for everybody else's kid, and I want to have something to do with my kid, and there's nothing happening. And then one day, when Alon had just turned one, I went down to the supermarket, and on the community bulletin board, there was a flyer in English announcing the start of these music classes called Your Baby Needs Music. I called the number at the bottom, and I readily signed up for this. It was great, it was English, it was something to do with alone. I got to the first class and was met at the door by this tiny little lady about this high, with white hair, very skinny. She introduced herself as Barbara Cass Beggs and invited us in. She told us to take off our shoes and socks, and she had all the parents sitting in a circle on the floor. She told us to put our children on our laps, and that she was going to say everything twice the first time we could listen, the second time we, we should repeat it with her, and if we knew the rhyme, we should say it both times. And then she started with a finger play. So there were 12 moms there with 12 kids, and I sat down, I put a load on my lap, and Barbara started doing some kind of finger play. And all the other moms were doing the finger play. And if the kids were old enough to be able to do it, they were doing it. And if they were too young, like if it was an infant, the parent would do the finger play in front of the child or use the child's hands to do it. Only my son was on my lap for about two seconds, and then he went off to explore the room. So right away I was faced with this dilemma. What do I do? Do I force a loan to sit on my lap? We all know what happens when you force a child to sit on your lap and he doesn't want to be there. Should I ignore him? If I ignore him, everyone's going to think that I'm a terrible mother. Or maybe they're going to think that he's a bad kid. Should I take him out of the room? I just paid money for these classes, and if I know my son, he's never going to sit on my lap. So right away, I was faced with this quandary, but Barbara came over to me, and she saw it immediately in my face and said, Betsy, don't worry about it. Children this age don't sit perfectly still. It's fine for him to keep wandering around. Just keep coming back. And because she said that to me, she put me at ease. So I developed a way, a method. I kept the side of my eye on alone at all times. And if he went anywhere near all of her props, her bags of musical instruments, I would physically take him and move him away. And if he had bothered another child, I would have interfered. But that wasn't his thing. His thing wasn't bothering. It was exploring. So he was exploring, and I was learning all these wonderful things. What I didn't know was I had stumbled onto something incredible. Barbara Cass Biggs was a Canadian music educator. She combi combi compiled Canadian folk music. She was a trained opera singer. She went to conferences on brain research before it was a cool thing to do and came up with this as yet unproven theory that babies can hear music when they're still in the fetus and now, well, they're still a fetus and now we know that that's true. And she devoted her retirement years to developing a method for teaching music to children and babies. She had been invited to do uh, some seminars at Tel Aviv Teachers University. And in Jerusalem, where I lived, there was a children's musician from America who read this tiny little thing in the paper saying Barbara Kaspex is coming to Tel Aviv. And so she wrote her a letter. Again, we didn't have internet back then. And she said, I'm a children's musician. I live in Israel. I have a baby. I want to take your course. Would you be willing to come? I'll arrange it if you come. And Barbara agreed. So I came into this class, and having been a librarian and worked with that age, I knew that you couldn't dumb down stuff for three-year-olds, for one-year-olds. It just doesn't work. But Barbara had taken traditional songs and adapted them in ways that made them very rich and appropriate for young children. For instance, you may know this, the rhyme, two little blackbirds sitting on a hill, one named Jack, one named Jill. So Barbara's version is this. And if you know it already, you can do it with me. Two little dicky birds sitting on a cloud. And the other name loud. Fly away soft. Fly away loud. Come back soft. Come back loud. And as you see, that just makes it so much richer because you're using the tone of voice alone with vocabulary words. Then she would hand out bells or some musical instrument. She'd always sing the same first song. We ring our bells together. We ring our bells together. We ring our bells together because it's fun to do. We ring our bells together, we ring our bells together, we ring our bells together because it's fun to do. Ring them up high, ring them down low, ring them in the middle. And if you look at that, it's brilliant. First of all, that is age appropriate for a one year old. The words are simple. But when you're ringing them up high, it's physically up high in a high voice and using the vocabulary would high. And the same thing with down low and the same thing with in the middle. So she's taking this simple song and making it rich and appropriate for a one-year-old. Then, in 
going through all these nursery rhymes, I had seen rhymes, but I couldn't figure out what to do with them. There was one I kept stumbling on, Mother and Father and Uncle John. I had no idea what to do until Barbara showed me it's a knee bounce. You put the child on your lap and you go, Mother and Father and Uncle John went to town one by one. Mother fell off and Father fell off, but Uncle John went on and 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 on. So I learned all this great stuff and alone's running around. And I go to the second session and I learn more and alone is running around. And I go to the third session that I'm learning more and alone is running around. And I don't remember if it was the fourth session or the fifth session, but when we got to mother and father and Uncle John alone came, he sat on my lap and he started leaning to the side before we got to the part where mother fell off. So that told me that this whole time he'd been running around seemingly not paying attention, he had observed everything to the point that he heard the words and he was able to anticipate the lean before we got there. Then he was off and running again, but when we came to the bells, he sat on my lap, he took a bell, and right along with everyone else, he rang his bell up high, he rang his bell down low, he rang his bell in the middle. This was pretty cool. So, next session was even better, next session was even better. And at the end of 10 sessions, I had seen an incredible difference in my child. His ability to pay attention, to follow directions, to be part of a group, had radically changed. So I fell in love with Barbara Caspegs and her Your Baby Needs Music program. Then, I think she realized she was towards the end of her life. She was 81 years old at the time, and she passed away two years later. She decided to stay in Israel a bit longer and train people to become instructors. So I readily signed up, and I became a certified instructor for your baby needs music classes. And I learned from Barbara that her approach was called the listen like learn approach. The idea is you listen to something, and then you hear it enough, it becomes like a friend. And when you hear it enough, you start to like it, and then when you like it, you're able to learn from it. And so I started doing Listen Like Learn classes at a maternity hospital. And then one of my friends said, hey, can you do it in my living room? You can bring alone too. So I started doing it in someone's living room, and someone else asked me, can you do music classes for me? And I was still working at the museum part-time, and I was running work helping someone as an assistant in their home daycare part-time, and I was doing this. And it was really a schlep, because I had all these bags with musical instruments. And we had one car, and I took a lot of public transportation. And after a year, I thought to myself, you know, in my library in the museum, there's a storage closet. And we're only doing preschool story time. We're not doing things for kids younger than that. Maybe I can combine Barbara's program with what I know about using books with kids and with the mission of my museum, which is illustration. So I sat down at my kitchen table with a piece of notebook paper, and I thought, what are the things I learned from Barbara that are the best practices? Well, one is she had different sections. It wasn't just like, here's a song, here's an activity, here's a song, here's an activity. It was like you always start with the passive, you move to the more active. And in the middle, what we know in story time, you stand up and you get your wiggles out. But she had different sections, so I had different sections. She always started with the welcoming comments, and she always had an opening ritual and a closing ritual. So she also had a secret formula, 80% repetition from session to session. Because the way you learn is by hearing it over and over again. So I took all that stuff, and then I thought about the collection of nursery rhymes we had in our museum, and my goal of bringing the illustrations alive, and I put that in. I called my program Mother Goose on the Loose, and I went to the head of the youth wing and said, you know, we do preschool story time for three to five year olds. Well, now I have a program for babies from birth to the age of three. Is it okay if I do it? And she said, no one's gonna come. Well, just let me try it. So we advertised it in the museum flyer, and the first week I had four adults with four kids, and the next week I had more, and the next week I had more. I lived in Israel for 12 years, and I ran Mother Goose and Lewis programs every week in the museum library. So it gave me plenty of time to figure out what worked and what didn't work and to tweak it. Now you may ask who come, who came to the programs. Well, English speakers who wanted their kids to learn the same songs that they knew, or tourists who had seen this advertisement in the paper and wanted something to bring their child to, or retired librarians and retired teachers who were really curious, what is she doing with one-year-olds and two-year-olds? And I'd always talk to people to find out their impressions and add stuff in. Plus, for me, the best part, you've heard in the news, Israel is this country with a lot of tensions. But in my library, I would have Jews and Christians and Muslims all sitting together in the same circle, singing songs, clapping for each other's children. And by the end of the program, a community had been created. And people would come back and come back. And then when it was over, they wouldn't leave. They would stay and talk. And if it was a nice day, they'd go out to the sandbox and hang out together. So I felt that it was more than just nursery rhymes, this program created community. 
1998, my family moved back to the States to uh, Baltimore, and I got a job with the Enoch Pratt Free Library. In my interview, I said, by the way, I have this program for babies from birth to the age of two. It's called Mother Goose on the Loose. Is it okay if I do it? And the response was not only is it okay, but we want you to do it. Because in the years I've been living abroad, technology had enabled all of these new findings of the brain. And neuroscientists were starting to write articles in mainstream magazines like Time and Newsweek saying that the architecture of the brain is formed in the first three years of life. And that what happens in those first three years are really important for the rest of the child's education and success at doing things as an adult. So parents are coming to the public library and saying, you have preschool story time. What do you have for my two-year-old? What do you have for my one-year-old? What do you have for my six-month-old? And there wasn't anything. And there wasn't library literature on it. And there wasn't Google. So you couldn't just Google programs for one-year-olds and find out what everybody else was doing. And here I had this time-tested program. So I started doing it, and as word got out, there's something to do with your babies, more and more people started coming. So I had to train some Pratt librarians, and more people came. And eventually I wrote an article for Public Libraries Magazine, and people started calling me from all over the country asking me to train them in Mother Goose on the Loose. So I give you the background just so you'll understand part of the principles. Behind it, as we go on, I'll refer back to the story. But, um, so let's go now to the PowerPoint. So, why does it say, oh, I thought I was plugged in. What is responsible for that weight gain? 
Anyone? I thought I heard someone say it. But let's have a look. Okay. Here is a picture of the neuron, and that one on the left is what a neuron looks like when a baby is born. And we can actually all make our hands into neurons. So make your hand into a neuron. This part down here, these are the roots of the neuron. This is the axon. Up here is something called cytoplasm, and the center is the nucleus. And um, up here are the dendrite spikes. So keep your neurons up, and I'm going to show you how learning takes place. A baby is born and has about 100 million neurons in the brain. That's all. Now the first thing that happens is the doctor puts the baby on mommy's stomach, and baby feels mommy's skin. So a connection is made. Can you bring your neuron a little closer to mine? So the roots of one neuron connect with the dendrite spikes of another. They don't actually touch, but there's water in the brain that conducts like an electrical current, and it makes a connection called a synapse that has a little bit of wave to it. So ding, baby feels mommy's skin. Now keep your, keep your things up there. Then baby smells mommy's smell. Ding, another connection. Then mommy hugs baby, and baby feels mommy's hug. Ding. And then mommy takes baby up to her breast and baby starts to nurse and takes mommy's milk. Ding, another synapse, another connection. And then mommy gives baby a kiss. Ding, another connection. Baby feels mommy's kiss and mommy says, oh, sweetie. Ding, baby hears mommy's voice. Another synapse is formed. Then mommy takes baby home. And when baby cries because he's hungry, mommy feeds him. Ooh, this lady takes care of my needs. Ding, another synapse. And when baby's diaper is wet, mommy changes it. Ding, another synapse, another bit of weight, another connection. And then mommy says, oh, baby, I love you so much. I love being your mommy. Ding, another synapse. And that is baby hears the word mommy. So all of these connections form the baby's definition of mommy. And every time a connection is made between the, um, the dendrite spikes and the roots of a neuron, there's a little bit of weight to that synapse. And that is what adds to the learning in the brain and builds the architecture of the brain, and that's what's responsible for the weight gain. So over here, you can see the mature neuron has all these synapses at the bottom. And it's kind of like a sapling tree and a grown tree. Right, the grown tree has its whole system of roots and it also has bark. So here, the bark is called the myelon sheath. It's kind of like the insulation of a wire. When an experience happens, nothing ever happens the same way twice, right? So when you have many different experiences on the same topic, and enough synapses are formed, it's like the brain says, okay, this is something we need to preserve. And so it grows bark, or like that myelon sheath, to protect it. It says these are valuable things to remember. And the myelon sheath is formed of a fatty substance, so it means that any future experiences on that topic will make the connection even quicker. It speeds it up. And so that's a good way to remember, and that's the way the learning is formed. The majority of those connections are made in the first three years of life, and anything that happens later on is built onto the synapses that are already formed. And so when people talk about the architecture of the brain being formed in the first three years of life, that's what they're talking about. So I had a friend who had a science class, and she had to learn the words to all this, so she made it to a song. So I'm just going to sing it once, and then you can sing it with me. Cytoplasm nucleus. Axon, myelon sheath, dendrites, synapse between neurons, synapse between neurons. Okay, can you guys all do that with me? Take out your neurons. And here we go. Cytoplasm nucleus, axon, myelon sheath, dendrites, synapse between neurons, synapse between neurons. Very good. So here's a chart with the growth of the brain, and you can see that the brain gains most of the weight in the first three years of life. And this is actually why it's considered most important for forming the structure for healthy development later on. And you can see, look, from birth to two, birth to three, and three to five, and then it's like, not that you ever stop learning, but it really is built on all those things that were formed earlier. Here's another example of the brain. Take out your hands one more time. And the brain is composed of three parts. This part is the brain stem. The thumb is the limbic system, and that's in the middle of the brain. So move your thumb in the middle. And then fold your fingers down over your thumb, and that is the cerebral cortex, which is the thinking part of the brain. Now, when a lot of people use the word brain, 
they often are mistakenly referring only to the cerebral cortex, only to the thinking part of the brain. But the brain is really all three of these, and a healthy brain is all three parts of the brain working together. The limbic system is the emotional center of the brain, and it's also like the cataloging library. What do I mean by that? Well, when you have an experience, the cataloging library looks at that experience and says, where does it go? So let's have an analogy. You're a librarian, and in your library, you have a shelf right at the front with bestsellers. It's actually a shelf called new books, but it's mostly bestsellers. And when people come in, they often go to that shelf first and take out books and bring them back. And your policy is for the first two months, any new books go on that shelf. Then someone comes to your library who donates a lot of money and says, oh, I just read about this new book on the history of stamps. Can you please buy that book for the library? So you buy it for the library, he reads it, and he returns it. Now, typically, if it's a new book, you would put it on that shelf. But you know no one in your area is going to want to read this boring, scholarly book on the history of stamps. So do you want to take up popular real estate for bestsellers and put the book there, or would you rather put it back on the shelf with the other stamp books so if someone needs it, they can find it, but that shelf of popular stuff has the stuff people really want. So the limbic system is that kind of library. It looks at the emotional tone of an experience and then catalogs it accordingly. So if it's a good experience, they're going to want to put it on that best shelf shelf where you can pull it out and you can look at it and relive it again and again. And if it's an inconsequential experience, it'll just throw it in the back. And if it's a bad experience, it'll try to bury it. Now, sometimes we have experiences that are so bad, we can't help reliving them over and over again. But in general, that is the way learning works, and that's why people say the more joyful an experience is, the more you're able to learn from it. And what are these emotional different contexts we have? Well, there's touch. We know there's good touch and bad touch. And then there's a the tone of voice, even though I say, I'm not angry. Yeah, yeah, you know that I'm still angry. And facial expression, again, even if I say I'm not angry, if I look at you, you can tell by my face that I really am. And then we know that music affects us. If we want to clean the house, we'll put on some really lively music to get us going, but if we're feeling a bit down in the dumps or we want to be comforted, maybe we'll put on something a bit quieter. And rocking often reminds us of when we were in the, in the mother's womb, and so that is a comforting thing. And smell, why smell? Because the limbic system is located in the brain, right next to the olfactory bulb. And so sometimes smell can bring on really strong emotions. I bet there are people in this room where you've been somewhere, and all of a sudden there's been a smell that has been so powerful, it's brought back a really strong emotional memory. And I see a number of people nodding their heads. Is there any uh, one or two people who would be willing to share an experience where they smelled something and brought back a memory? Anyone? Yeah. One day I was at the um, used to be Roses down on Oak Pine Street, mm -hmm. and my mother had been dead for a while, and she smoked and she uh, liked peppermint. Well, there was an elderly lady who came in the store, and she smelled like my mother. And I followed. I told her editor about this. I followed <laughs> this little lady around in the store just so I could smell her. <laughs> she did her story times, 
because she thought that subtly the kids would smell that scent and who mm, later on when they grew up if they smelt it, they may not connect it with her, but it would be with this feeling of warmth and joy and love of books. So the idea of these three parts of the brain, the brain stem is represented by a lizard and that is for the, um, the survival functions. Then we have the cat nursing her kittens for the limbic system, for the emotional center, and we have the thinker for the cerebral cortex. And really, when we talk about healthy brain development, we are not talking about a child who's so good intellectually that they can spout out facts and get A's on every test. What we're talking about it is a child who has all three parts of the brain working together. So we want someone who has social, emotional, and intellectual skills. Not just being able to do well on a test, but being able to relate to other people. Being able to understand that what they say and how they act has consequences. To look at the way they act and the way it affects someone. To think about it, to realize, hey, I shouldn't have said that, it made them feel bad. And then to take that into account when they're planning the next time how to act. So we really want to put feeling and thinking together to help people reflect, plan, and evaluate. And that is the ultimate goal of getting the brain to work together in an optimal way. There was a study done with uh, parents and babies. They took the babies and they put these round circles in front of their faces and measured how long they looked at them. The one on the bottom was pink, not orange, and the baby didn't look for very long. When I was a baby, and probably a few other people around here, all the baby toys were always pastel color. But then, when this study came out, if you keep going, you'll see white they didn't pay attention to, red not so much, but the target shape, the red and the white, look at the difference in the time they paid attention. So at that point, baby, baby toys started changing, and now you'll notice the majority of baby toys are brightly colored in pattern. But then they kept going, and when they got to the representation of the human face, they saw that the child paid attention for an extraordinarily long time. And so the scientists determined that children are pre-programmed to connect with other human beings. They did other studies. One of them, they had breast pads, one with the mother's milk, one with someone else's milk. They put it on either side of the child's head, and in every single instant, the child turned their head towards the breast pad with the mother's milk. And from that, they determined that children are pre-programmed to connect with their mothers. So studies then by psychologists said that the first relationships that we have actually helps develop what kind of person we're going to be later on in life. And so John Boldy came up with this attachment theory. Uh, have you heard about the attachment theory? Raise your hand. OK, so that is that saying if a child feels safely attached to an adult in the earliest years of life, they're going to do much better later on in life. And they had this test where it's called the strain situation. They had a room with one-way glass, and they had a parent come in with a child. And a very young child and then say, I have to step out for a few minutes, I'll be back, and leaves. And then the child usually cries. And when the parents come back, the question is, is the child comforted by having the parent be back? Does the child keep crying? Or does the child not even notice when the parent leaves? And when they looked at this scenario played out over and over again, they saw that in most cases, the child who had a good attachment with the parent who felt safe was upset when they left and was happy and comforted when they came back. And they followed all these ch children through adulthood, and they found the ones that felt secure about their relationship with their parent were the ones who ended up being more successful, had more belief in themselves, and more courage to go out in the world and try new things and get better jobs and get better salaries. So they said that the attachment theory shows that the, what happens in the earliest years of life makes a difference. Now, I forgot I have to say something here. I gave this presentation in British Columbia, in Canada, and someone sent me an email afterwards, and she said, I never thought that if I went to a library workshop that it would bring up very bad memories for me. But when you were talking about the brain, it brought back some childhood memories I prefer not to think about. And I know it's really important for you to talk about, but you should warn people ahead of time. So I'm sorry I didn't warn you ahead of time, and I hope this is not difficult for anyone. What happens is anything in life can be overcome. And if you start out without a good start, you can, you can get help and you can do it on your own, but it just makes it harder, and it's not as easy. And so part of our goal as people working with children is to enable them to have the best start they can possibly get. 
In the brain, there are chemicals called neurotransmitters. Cortisol is the stress hormone. And when you're feeling uh, stressed out, your cor cortisol level rises. Children who are in very difficult situations who have cortisol level rise quite frequently, at some point, it stays up. Now, what does that mean? I think of cortisol like a brick wall. If I think someone is trying to get me, I want to build the brick wall to keep them away. But then the coast is clear, I can let the brick wall go down. But if enough, ta enough times it happens that I think someone's trying to get me, at some point I'm going to say, you know what, I can't let my defenses down. That brick wall has to stay there because then when I'm not paying attention, it'll still keep those guys out. So that's what happens with a young child. If they are being abused, if they are being neglected, if the parent is being abused, or even if they're living in a neighborhood where there's a lot of violence and whenever they go out of the house, the mother's really scared, the level of cortisol keeps rising and going down, rising, going down, and finally the brain rearranges itself. And the architecture of the brain stays and the cortisol level stays high. So what that means is when the child enters school, that child may have a great IQ, but they have a different architecture of the brain. So for the other kids, the information may just walk right in. But for this kid, the information comes, it hits the wall, and has to learn how to jump over the wall to go in. So they have a harder time learning with the high, heightened levels of cortisol. And so again, people have been developing systems to help kids with these changes be able to learn better. But it's something that if we could alleviate that in the earliest years, we would like to. Serotonin, on the other hand, is a neurotransmitter that makes us feel good. People who suffer from depression take drugs like Prozac that help you make, make you feel happier. And for this, I think of my high school years when I was boy crazy. And if I was in my regular class, I would have paid attention to the teacher. But if they put me into a new class with two kids, I'd be looking around going, oh, is that guy looking at me? Oh, does the hair look OK? Is the shirt OK? And I wouldn't be focusing on the teacher because I'd be worried what other people were thinking. So they say that in an optimal learning environment, if we want kids to be able to learn their best, it has to be very low stress and high comfort level. So that's back to the story with alone now. That if I had been thinking everyone was judging him and judging me, I would have spent the whole time focusing on myself and my child, and I wouldn't have been able to learn all those wonderful songs by Barbara. But because she told me, it's fine, children this age sit perfectly still, I was able to relax, and therefore I was able to learn. And so when we're doing our programs, the most important part of the whole thing is actually not the content of the program, but it's the atmosphere that we create when we're doing the program. The thing is we want to create an environment where people feel safe. And again, let's go back to that story with me and alone and how it could have turned out totally differently. And so one of the ways we do that is by smiling at people and by welcoming them in and make sure that it's a non-judgmental environment. And for Mother Goose on the Loose, I do that by having the welcoming comments. Those are comments that I always start off a program with. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mother Goose on the Loose. My name is Miss Betsy, and I'm delighted to see you here today. Then I give directions. The way things are going to work is I'm going to say everything twice the first time you listen, the second time you repeat it with me, and if you know it, you're welcome to say both times. Then I give the guidelines. Children of this age don't sit perfectly still. It's fine for them to wander around. However, Please pretend there's an invisible circle around the flannel board, and if your child comes up and goes within that circle, pick them up and take them back to their seat. Otherwise, it's fine for them to wander around. And that part is really important, because if you don't spell it out, then a little kid's going to come up to the flannel board, and the mother's going to think, what am I going to do? And so she calls out, Joe, Joe! And of course, one-year-old Joe isn't going to go back. And then she feels like, if I get up and get him, I'm going to be interrupting, or I'm big, I'm going to come in, and, and then she doesn't know, but if you say in the welcoming comments, if it's a matter of course, come and bring up your kid and take them back, then she doesn't feel awkward and the situation is dealt with. 